the history of our world has been closely associated with a spirit of veneration. Progress has been always most rapid when human beings chose their ideals on a level of insight, integrity, and understanding. As we go back in the story of human experience, we realize that from the earliest time, we were inclined to recognize the importance of ideal types of persons representing lives of principle, of value, of dedication, and in many instances of martyrdom. In the very early history of our religions, we know that cities had their sovereign deities, communities, their tutelary divinities. Every art and craft and trade and profession was committed to the care of some invisible spiritual power. There were deities everywhere. And while today we are inclined to regard such an attitude as naive or childish, its practical value was far more real than we suspect. When Socrates took his disciples out to stroll and study, they would choose some pleasant grove, and there seating themselves, they would listen while Socrates discoursed to them about the great truths of ethics and virtue. And the philosopher always asked the benediction of the spirits that dwelt in these groves. The dryads and hamadryades, the invisible beings that bless these pleasant places with their presences. And the students and the master together felt the sacredness of this association. This sacredness meant that where they had chosen to study was really a temple of spirits, a place set aside. And in this place, the ordinary concerns of life were not appropriate. This was no place for argument or selfish arrogance. This was no place for disrespect or unfriendliness. For not only had they gathered to learn, but they had gathered in the presence of beings invisible whom they respected. And they realized that these beings had certain powers over the estates of men, and that to be false to principles, even in the presence of invisible powers, was to open oneself to the punishments of nature. In the early times also, the guilds and trades had their patron divinities, later their patron saints. The physician was a dedicated priest. The lawyer was a servant of the great deity Themis, the principle of truth. The architect followed the ancient deities of his profession. All men regarded themselves as laboring in the presence of eternals. And these invisible presences pass judgment upon all the labors of men. Therefore, it was not simply the worship of the deities that constituted the important ethical factor. It was the recognition that all our labors are in the terms of a spiritual presence. Everything we do has a guardian angel. 
And if we offend this guardian angel, our affairs do not go well. In other words, this was an old way of looking at cause and effect, at ethics, at the recognition man was responsible to the infinite for the skills and the powers that he possessed. And if he was an honorable man, he dedicated his abilities to the universal life which sustained all ability and made all things fruitful and good. To betray an honored profession or a skilled craft or to pervert a great art, such an action was a sin against the ancient gods who, looking down, weighed the consciences of men. Even today, in most parts of the world, both Eastern and Western, there are remnants of these older ways. Merchants still have their patron deities, and it is assumed throughout the whole extent of Islam that when men barter and sell, a spirit stands with them to judge the merit of this exchange. A man has no right to cheat his neighbor, for although the neighbor may not discover this in time, the spirit is there. And this spirit weighs and judges and punishes and rewards of itself. Sometimes we assume that this spirit is our own conscience, something dwelling within ourselves that it is not good to offend. For if we begin offending this conviction, which is our natural heritage of integrity, life becomes less beautiful, less meaningful, less rich. And we begin to develop a certain bitterness, a certain unkindness. We become resentful and rebellious. And the beauty of our living is slowly taken away. Many of the old beliefs have lived on into our more modern times. And in early Christianity, we had the calendar of saints. There was a saint for every day in the week, every week of the month and every month of the year. In some occasions, these saints were so largely multiplied in time that there were many saints for a single day. The thought behind this was not merely the canonization of martyrs or of ancient teachers. The real thought was that each day we lived under the guidance and protection of a saintly power. On these days, it was appropriate to ask the help and blessing of the patron saint. This could not, however, be done with a clear conscience if we had betrayed the honesties of that day. If we had committed an error, had been unkind or cruel or critical, we offended this saint, and its power was not quickly available to us unless we showed a suitable repentance. Uh, the uh, patron saint comes also in European thinking as the natal saints of persons. In the medieval Christianity, every human being was placed in the keeping of a saint. Very often, this saint's name was given to that person. And from that time on, there was some strange affinity there was a closeness, and in time of emergency, the person whose name was that of a saint called upon this saint for help. But to do so, this person had to be of a right mind. The requirement, the request, must come from a real and honest need. The individual must have the conviction that his daily life was such that his patron, patron saint was proud of him, 
was inclined to be kindly to him and would help him in his emergencies. Naturally, if he was corrupt, he could not call upon this saintly power with a good conscience. It's interesting psychologically to consider this ancient way of doing things, this tying of life from the beginning to the protection of a power that was available to the good and for the good, but was, was withheld from evil or from that which corrupted itself. These days we do not have very much thinking, particularly in modern times, about the old patron saints. But we have the same need, to a certain degree at least, that our ancestors had. So we have gone out and created what we might term an order of heroes. These heroes we do not call upon for help because we do not regard them as spiritual beings. We do, however, depend upon them to some degree in the molding of our own characters. Each person who has a sincere respect or veneration for someone illustrious or important or significant instinctively moves his own character into a similitude with that of the respected ideal. If we respect a great scientist, we want to understand him, the moods and the motives that impelled him to his discoveries. And if science is our subject, we want to be like him. We want to have his virtues and we are quick to overlook his vices. He represents an achievement of some kind, and we want to know how he achieved. And if we find that he was a highly dedicated person, sacrificing much for the advancement of knowledge, then we gain some inspiration from this. It becomes important to us also. So all around the world we have our heroes, and these heroes are ideals which we build up. They become patterns in ourselves upon which we can cast the likeness of our own disposition. So these patterns still hold a very real influence. And in the modern time, we are a little disturbed at some of these patterns, that individuals do not choose their heroes wisely is a serious hurt to them a serious hurt far worse than having no hero at all. Because actually we all have heroes of some kind. We cannot say that there is no one in our lives who inspires us to some higher achievement, no one in the history of our world who has not virtues that we would like to emulate. But it is rather too bad when we choose these heroes merely for attitudes or for achievements that are not important, not valuable, not real, not significant. And this is a rather common problem of our time, where we gather our heroes from movie stars and prize fighters and baseball players, where at the moment perhaps our greater heroes are those who have a certain cynical attitude toward life, the disillusioned, uh, the preachers of disaster, the person who insists upon being different but does not achieve any improvement of character. So we choose our heroes from the wealthy, from the famous, from the notorious. We even have certain secret reverence and respect for gangsters and criminals. Something has happened, and the thing that has happened is undoubtedly part of the inevitable byproduct of the loss of a powerful religious directive in life. We are still nominally a religious people, but in one way or another our minds have been turned from our spiritual needs to the fulfillment of our material purposes and ambitions. As a result, we are likely to turn for directive 
to those who have achieved the ends we immediately desire. We want to know how they succeeded, and we are no longer interested in whether they were good or not. Thus, we have developed a kind of heroism that is traceable to television shows, motion pictures, current literature, the theater, and uh, various well-publicized sections of social activity. These patterns seldom have overtones that are desirable. Perhaps uh, we are able to accept these distorted images and uh, comparatively ignore their psychic pressures upon ourselves. But as we watch children growing up and young people choosing their careers, we observe a notable decline in spiritual value, in the recognition of those principles which we should strive uh, to practice in our own uh, living and thinking. We have heroes here in this country. Some of them are very good heroes. Others are not so good. But we still have them, and we will always have them, because they are part of our natural instinct to venerate something. We have to. Also, the hero or the saint is somewhat more accessible to us than some strange remote divinity abiding in the innermost parts of space. It is therefore rather easier for us to honor good men than good as an abstract thing. It is easier for us to associate courage with the courageous person than to think of it as some force moving invisibly in space. Among the great heroes of American life, I suppose the outstanding one is Abraham Lincoln. He represents to a great many persons something of the simple humanity that we recognize to be important, something of the dedication of the individual to conviction. He represents to our thinking an honest leader, dedicated to the good of his people, crowning his uh, dedication with his own life through, mart through martyrdom. So many, many thousands of travelers stopped before the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, and standing in the presence of this great statue, read the inscription on the wall of the famous Gettysburg Address. And we feel that in a way, he is an uncanonized saint, standing for the best of American life and American thought and American dedication. Then we have many others to whom we turn in various ways, young people of inventive mind, honor the heroes of aviation or electronics. We honor various people. But in all this honoring, we are too often uh, not inclined to accept the great challenge of that which we honor. Today, there are not so many who stand in the presence of the statue of Lincoln, who are really aware of the source of Lincoln's strength. We think we can call upon his memory as a model upon which to build a better life for ourselves. But we do not realize that Lincoln's strength arose primarily from faith, from deep conviction within himself, and that he was a noble example of the great faith that was given to us by our forebears, a faith in truth, in God, in life, in justice, a faith in principles and realities, a faith which not only stood strong for the things that it believed, but also knelt humbly in prayer to the source of all strength. So in our heroes of the day, we are more in apt to consider their achievements than the spiritual roots from which these achievements grew. We have forgotten 
that the truly great persons in history whom we admire were persons of great faiths, great dedications, great humility to the sovereign principle that rules all things. All over the world, religious heroes have arisen, and probably together they constitute the highest of the traditional ideals that we have. The great founders of the world's religions and philosophies and ethical systems still stand as the ideal types of mankind. They were not only the strong ones of their day, and not only has their strength descended to us over 20, 30, 40 centuries, but they were the strength behind the strong ones we have created. They were the strength behind the Washingtons and the Lincolns. They were the strength behind those dedicated persons who have helped to enrich our world. There is a chain of dedication, a descent of value based upon man's inner veneration for that which is truly, ultimately, and completely good. This spirit we have always recognized, and it becomes our help in all the critical emergencies which arise in living. For the Christian world, the great example is the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. When we say this, we not only affirm that which has been the faith of our fathers, but also we stand side by side with many of the best thinkers of the non-Christian world. There is not a religion in the world today that does not honor Jesus Christ. Other faiths may have their own saints and sages, but all over the world Jesus is recognized as one of the great good men of all time. He is recognized, therefore, as more than a person. The historical Jesus we know very little about. This, however, has no essential meaning. Uh, if we knew more, we would not be the better off. Actually, the Jesus that we uh, uh, venerate today is not a man walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee or on the dusty road to Capernaum. The Jesus that we recognize, we honor, we venerate is really a creation built of the love and veneration of hundreds of millions of human beings. He represents to the world today a great archetypal pattern, a great picture in space of virtue, of integrities and dedications that we so desperately need in order to meet the challenge of our own uh, daily existence. Therefore, each of us in the course of living more or less creates within himself the image of the Christos. It is an image in the heart. Our forebears cast medals of gold and silver and brass and copper and iron. And on these medals they place the traditional likenesses of Jesus and of the Virgin Mary and the apostles and the martyrs and the sanctified ones of long ago. They wore these medals over their hearts. And in traveling in the Middle Ages, many of them fastened the medal to their hats so that it would be visible at a distance. Uh, these medals were created for the purpose of indicating that the wearer of the medal had a pact with this spiritual power within himself, that he was dedicated to it. And into the keeping of this power he placed his life, his honor, and his sacred goods. Whatever he owned, whatever he possessed, was dedicated to the service of this guiding, protecting power. Many yet wear various religious medals. And in each instance they do signify a faith or a trust 
in an invisible presence. The canonization of saints in the West has been man's way of honoring extraordinary dedication and virtue. A man's subjective belief that those who loved man in life worked for humanity, served their fellow men through many years, and then passed into a larger universe, would still have the good of their human brethren close to their hearts, to serve in space as they had served in life the needs of their fellow creatures. So for many centuries the prayers to saints went up throughout Europe and to saintly beings throughout Europe, Asia, Africa, and all the continents of the earth. All these represent the building of a conviction in man, a conviction that tells of that which is right, that which is true, that which is created to lead, to command, and to require a standard of good from all human beings. So we like to think that in the, as time goes on, that perhaps these archetypes within our own natures change somewhat. It is quite probable that there was a great change in the religious archetype in man at the time of the Protestant Reformation. There have been many unfoldments of faith in the nearly 2,000 years since the creation of the Christian religion. One thing we have to learn, and which some of us are a little slow to learn, and that is that religions, like every other phase of human development, evolve. They grow. The life of a religion is in its growth just as surely as the life of any creature. It is measured by its growth. When growth ceases, life ceases. So we cannot expect ancient faiths that survive to remain unaltered in periods of human change and the unfoldment of human skills and crafts over periods of time. So the Christian archetype has to a degree unfolded. It has grown uh, richer in many ways. It has been impoverished by doubts. It has been compromised by false teachings. But its essential principles have unfolded and grown and matured and mellowed with the passing of time. One of the indications of the unfoldment of our Christianity has, be has been its gradually increasing inclusiveness. We are now able, probably for the first time, uh, to recognize Christianity's place in a world of religions. That the beginning of Christianity as a religion is the same as the beginning of Christianity in the life of the person. Uh, the true Christian is a good brother to his fellow men. And now Christianity as a great religion is beginning to recognize its bonds of brotherhood with all other faiths. Little by little, prejudices that arose from ignorance are vanishing away. And the possibility of a recognition of the spiritual aspiration, the spiritual good, the spiritual need shared by all human beings, that these great sharings constitute the foundation of a richer religious experience than we have ever previously known. In the continual development of our Christian faith, there has also been a slow but consistent development of personal Christianity the individual uh, making his religion essentially the core of his own life, that he has now the feeling that he has the right to interpret the Christ image and the Christ message uh, according to some personal values within himself, that he possesses the consciousness, the intelligence, the maturing integrities which enable him to interpret his faith for himself according to his need. Thus all over the world today there are many devout believers who have more or less private faiths, faiths that arise from 
the ad adaptation of a general religion to the unfolding consciousness of the person himself. Some look with reluctance and anxiety upon these personal faiths, but really they are part of a growth that needs uh, to be recognized as important. The most important thing in all religion is that the individual shall interpret it in his own life. To do this, he must gradually develop a basic spiritual conviction, a conviction which he can apply and which will enrich and mature his inner experience. If we should look around in our own way of life for the great hero, for the great symbol of our own maturity, the Christian world would almost certainly unite in the recognition of the life and teachings of Jesus. He represents not only a human being or a divine being, he represents a way of life a conviction above compromise. He represents to the world dedication. Dedication not to self-purpose, but to divine purpose through self. And all over the world, there is the subconscious tendency of those who believe uh, to wish that they could be nearer in character and in conduct to their eternal hero. In this uh, thinking, it seems that it is very important for us uh, to follow some of the thinking that has been developing within the last five years, that it is no longer necessary to completely identify the life of Jesus with a religion. While we know that he had a faith which he gave to the world and which the world named after him. Still it is true that he stands uh, apart from any doctrine. He stands as a unique person. He stands as an example of individual dedication to principle. Uh, he forms not only an appropriate symbol, but an available one. For of all the human beings that have lived upon this earth, he is probably better known everywhere than any other human being. That this should occur is itself an extraordinary testimony, that persons of good spirit everywhere have found in the ideal life of Jesus a support and a substantiation for the convictions of good within themselves. Therefore, it would seem perfectly possible in these times uh, to recognize uh, that the life of Jesus is uniquely significant from a psychological and from an ethical point of view. While uh, we may or may not wish to commit our people to any faith, we can very clearly point out the sublimity of a course of conduct, a way of life. We do not realize it, but we are creating idols all the time. And it is important that idols should only be the embodiments of ideals. When they are not worthy to express noble convictions, then indeed they become truly idols, objects of false worship. A false worship is not the worship of wood or stone. The false worship is the worship of a conviction that is not worthy. False worship is a compromise of principle, the indi individual bestowing upon God or upon a concept of God, that which is not noble, not ethical, and not acceptable to a true God of any true faith. So today, it would seem as though uh, Jesus stands as an appropriate person for a great study, not a study of 
religion, but a great study of human purpose. There is no reason why every public school should not approach him in his aspect as an archetype of the kind of human being we want to create and produce by our own cultural patterns, whatever they may be, that we have in him the symbol of a mature, proper human being. He is not some strange, mysterious type, remote in space. The story of his life is a story of a person. We can or we can or we cannot acknowledge uh, some of the theological elements of the story. This depends upon our own allegiances. But we cannot deny the nobility of the man. We cannot deny the example that he gave. And we cannot deny that we are in desperate need of that example today. One way in which we can achieve part of our end would be the recognition in education of the simple need for heroes, for the heroic living of a great life. Our educational institutions today abound in critical studies of the great leaders of the world. We can find excellent courses on Plato and Aristotle, and in comparative religion and in various seminaries we can find a very advanced courses on the life of Jesus and other teachers. But similarly, these courses, like nearly every other form of our education, suffer from a certain sterility. We memorize words, we follow the courses of careers, we do what children in Sunday school have done for generations, follow the journeys of St. Paul with white tacks on a blackboard. But some way, we can follow his journeys anywhere and everywhere. We can find him shipwrecked, we can find him uh, in danger and in trouble and in persecution and in martyrdom. But some way, we do not experience these religious, philosophical, and ethical leaders as ideals of personal conduct. We do not receive from our education any concept that these good lives should inspire us to good living. We have the intellectual acceptance of them, but this intellectual acceptance is not vitalized. It is not made warm with dedication. We no longer follow the ancient way of the gills in which the masters gathered in the simple Eucharist, recognizing in Jesus, for example, not the Messiah only, but the child of the carpenter helping Joseph in his little shop. These carpenter men of the Middle Ages had a great affinity to the carpenter of Galilee. They saw in him the true master builder. And in their dedication, they wanted to be like him. And we have the stories of the old guildsmen and their prayers and their dedications, and their simple symbols. They built a house prayerfully, asking that the spirit of peace and of truth abide in that house, and that those who were to live in the house would live together in Christian charity, that this house was a symbol of security, of men providing protection for each other. The problem was not how much can we make in profit from the house? So this very thought would probably have caused the old guildsman to be cast out of his guild. For in those days, these labors were sacred. Men were entitled to their wages. The workman is worthy of his hire. But men do not build for wages. They build to reveal truth, beauty, love, friendship, brotherhood. The various labors that we perform become dignified only by their dedication to principles. 
And in our modern world, we need something of this kind. And if society will not give it to us, then we must give it to ourselves. I talked not long ago to the head of a very large corporation, uh, which has ramifications throughout our entire national life. This particular man was very close to personnel. He was the one who had to keep his eye on the career men that were rising within this organization. And he said, we learned years ago that we had to do more than to promise these men gradual promotion. We had to do something to create in these men what money cannot create, and that is true loyalty. We had to prove to these men that we employed that what they were doing was important, that it was important not to themselves but to other people, to keep these men happy and busy. Each one had to be able to feel in his own heart that his labor was honorable, that it was conducive to public good, that this particular industry met a real need and not an artificial one. And to the degree that these persons felt not only the security of a good job, but that through this job they were contributing to the betterment of their world, it was only then that really allegiance was created. It was only then that the good workman could be picked out. He was the one who accepted his job as part of an, a labor of necessity in society. And he said that most large organizations face this same problem. And the individual does not have in himself the capacity to sense the importance of dedication. The individual who is only interested in the advancement within the structure, who is looking only for the periodic pay raises, who has no real motive except to work his hours and get out, this individual will never really amount to very much in that business. He has to have a purpose beyond himself. This is true throughout society and is one of the great neglected areas of modern culture. This creation of a real purpose. It is for lack of purpose that we have riots on campuses. It is for lack of purpose that individuals, particularly young people, are building false codes or no code at all. It is for lack of purpose that they waste their time and endanger their lives and the lives of others. There is no dedication to a real reason for being alive. Though it may well be that in the intricate interval involved civilization of which we are a part, it is hard for the individual to find a real purpose for himself. Yet the only real need is for him to take any of his daily problems in a different light. Every day we are confronted with decisions, responsibilities, and opportunities that have a bearing on the concept of purpose. Every day we can do things either only for ourselves or for something more than ourselves. We can recognize our place in a very closely involved social pattern and the recognize that there is a thing to do, there is a something at hand that can call for a dedication, can make life much better and make the problems of neurosis fewer. So in the, the beginning, perhaps, is the constant search for the meaning of the common things we do in the light of a dedication. Nearly all human beings in the course of time raise their families. 
Here is a tremendous area of dedication, which is very largely neglected today, with self-seeking taking the place of common good. Here is an area in which the individual can recognize his sovereign importance in nature, that the individual who is responsible for guiding a family carries with him a tremendous internal dedication, that every member of the family has dedications, mostly toward the common security and advancement of the group. But today the group is sacrificed to the individual everywhere. And the reason for this is the fact that within ourselves there are no clear guides as to what is important. In looking for some way of becoming aware of importance, uh, we nearly all resist preachments. We can read, we can listen, we can hear why we should be better than we are. <clears throat> We can listen to statistics to indicate the miseries that will come to us if we remain no better than we are. But these become rather dull, and the individual is almost indifferent to them. The, the only answer that we really have is that something must light a light in ourselves. A spark must come within our own natures and without this spark, the labor is in vain. The thing that has to happen is a kind of warmth that takes the place of intellect, a feelingfulness about value that becomes more important to us than a criticism of the activities of our neighbors. There has to be something that binds us with a great dedication. And while to others this dedication may not seem to be overwhelming, it is sufficient if it binds us to the maturity of our own character, if it binds us to a dedication of value. Another important factor in dedication, of course, always comes the great question as to what is best. All over the world, people are confused as to what dedication should be. They do not actually know what is best for themselves. They do not know how to guide others best. And as a result, much good intention not only goes to waste, but complicates life. There seems to be no way in which the person can be sure that he is doing good, sure that he is right in his own devotions, in his own ideals. This, of course, brings us right back to the problem of the heroic life. The great milestones, the great examples which have guided progress from the beginning have been persons who possessed of tremendous integrities of rightness, have proven their points. If we are not certain what is good, then nearly always we fall back upon a code of good. We fall back upon some pattern of conviction that has stood the test of time. Actually, we subconsciously realize that principles have not changed, that the outward nature of things takes on new appearance, but in substance values are almost eternal in themselves. The patterns of friendship may change, but friendship does not change. The patterns of faith may become more complicated and diversified, but faith as a vital force does not change. Hope while it may take on innumerable appearances, is still something that carries us through the day toward a better tomorrow of some kind. Charity remains. And whether this charity is merely sharing our worldly goods or whether it is inside understanding, 
many individuals who will give to causes or will not be charitable in their thinking. So we try to find some archetype, some pattern, some code of good. We have such codes as the code of Hammurabi and the code of Moses. We have also a very practical code in the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. We have codes of all kinds, but codes are not quite enough. Codes are a little too close uh, to thou shalt and thou shalt nots. The, the code seems to be merely a limitation, a restriction upon ourselves. When an indifferent, careless, thoughtless person is required to improve himself, he does so grudgingly, and the improvement is very seldom real. Improvement arises from some great vision within ourselves by which we resolve to be happier and better by bringing happiness to some inner spiritual part of our nature which can only rejoice when we are right. So above all codes and creeds, as we are inclined to know them, still stands the example, the human testimony to the working of eternal principles. And on Easter Sunday, we are really gathered for the purpose of honoring the eternal, inevitable resurrection of truth. We are here to recognize and realize within ourselves the truth persecuted, ridiculed, is still triumphant. The truths reviled and rejected, submerged in untruthful situations, ideals sacrificed in the growth of material structures, all things which have within them the inner reality of right are immortal. And though they may seem to die, yet shall they live again. And all the way through time, the love of God and the love of men as moods, as inner experiences in the human heart, rise triumphantly over all the hatreds, all the materialities which we have carelessly fashioned. So we are here to recognize a standard, a stature of good. We are here to recognize a living text of value and to also remember that this truth that we seek to understand, this value which we seek to apply in action, is both of these are immortal. They represent an ever-returningness, and as in the springtime, the death of winter passes to reveal the resurrection of the spring. So through the winters of materiality, the good in man may seem to die. But give an opportunity, warmed by the light of appreciation, strengthened by the instinct to venerate, all this good rushes out again. The good in man can no more die than the good in spirit. And as surely as all things which have died in truth are born again, so all the truths in us, though they sleep, can be wakened by dedication. There is no individual in whose heart there is not a holy sepulcher. There is no individual who cannot cause the Christ-likeness to arise in himself if he so desires. And this arising of the Christ in you, which is the hope of glory, is the mystical resurrection, the mystical continuance, 
the continuing embodiment of truth in an infinite diversity of forms, a continual, perpetual, eternal metempsychosis, an ever-repeated uh, return of life, a coming back again in new form of the eternal truth that can never die. Our religious ancestors held that man's power to restore his own spiritual estate arose from the very life within him. Man is not only a form, but he is a life. He possesses within himself the power to be a living thing. And in this aliveness, he shares himself with everything else that lives. For one life, one magnificent energy, ensouls all things. And because this life is itself universal, and because so far as man is concerned, this universal life is God, so it may properly be said that this eternal life, impelling all things to eternal virtues, resides in even the most darkened, critical, and negative human being. The great problem is to release it, to restore it, to bring it forth again, that it may be transformed in body and shine through the forms which nature has created. For whether there is any essential difference between this eternal life in the soul of man and this same eternal life manifesting itself in the unfolding of the Easter lily, this is a matter for individuals to contemplate. But the truth is that while there is life, the root of good endures. While life can burst through the darkness of winter, wisdom, truth, ideal, understanding can burst through the darkness of ignorance. Man possesses the power at any moment to rededicate his attitudes and his convictions. Now some will say that such rededication is of no meaning in a world such as the one we live in, that these dedications simply come forth to be blighted by the early frosts of materialism that the individual who has dedications will be the most hurt. All of this, however, is a very relative state of thinking. Actually, the individual who has dedications is less hurt. For to whatever degree our inner principles become enlightened within ourselves, we have a strength against adversity that the person who is unenlightened can never possess. The unenlightened individual must shake his fist at heaven, blame the earth, blame his neighbors, blame nature, regret his own existence. He has no answer. He can only suffer his way through the course of years, grasping at moments of pleasure and finding them slipping through his fingers. This person who apparently is free from the responsibility of dedication has also exiled himself against its benefits. It is true that the dedicated person can suffer. It is true that dedication will not lift from us the burden of life. We must go through the same experiences that afflict the undedicated, at least some of them but we go through them with a strength of inner understanding and insight. We find that we are not offended as the unenlightened person is offended. We find that in our emergencies, our dedications sustain us. And gradually, a greater tranquility, a greater peace of soul comes to us because we have a stronger and truer light of insight within ourselves. Whatever peace we have, whatever security we know, whatever true happiness we experience, these things arise from our own inner virtues, 
our own inner understanding, our own internal recognition of the great values of existence. We have to have these things. We have to experience them every day. And one thing that our ancestors did, which we no longer uh, do quite so frequently at least, is to make re continual restatements in one way or another of the principles of our faith. It was not merely a matter of going to church all the time. It was a cultivation of the spirit of gratitude toward life. Religion was very close to our forefathers. It was close to them when they gathered in the evening to read the Bible. It was close to them at grace at the table before and sometimes after meals. It was close to them in evening prayer. It was close to them in discussing the virtues and principles of their faith with their children. Religion was very close to those of older generations. And all this interchange helped to strengthen the archetypal vital image of a faith. Those who were a little weak in their believing found new strength in trying to bestow spiritual strength upon their children. Those whose doubts were rather uh, grave found strength in the devotion of their neighbors. Things were sort of held together, and through this all this holding came this image of dedication, uh, this concept of life as a service of good, life as a preparation here for an eternal growth beyond. This being a very vital thing was useful. We, we today do not have it, and we wonder why our delinquency rates are rising all the time, why young people no longer have resources. What is resource? Resource is inner strength. Resource is the individual having a belief within himself so strong that he cannot violate it without the deepest regret. Where this is not available, there is no code of conduct except man-made law, which is something to avoid and escape. So we realize the importance of the Easter ceremony as probably the greatest of the festivals of Christianity. Uh, Easter and Christmas certainly are the two great festivals. But Easter some way is a more universal festival. It ties more closely to this concept of the eternal resurrection and restoration of the good. Uh, it comes closer to the vital experience of persons, in each of whom this restoration of value must be achieved by personal effort. Now, there are two ways in which this personal effort can be achieved. One might be termed philosophical and the other mystical. The philosophical approach is a rationalization of value. It is perfectly possible to do this. It is perfectly possible to take a simple good life and organize it into a magnificent philosophy of purpose. The uh, very example of the noble person with all of its complications and its consequences may be used as the foundation for a vast rationalization. We can study step by step all of the incidents that went together in the chain of events which make up the life of Jesus. We can rationalize and interpret every word that he spoke. We can try to understand and gain a tremendous sense of obedience. We can take oath and obligation that we shall keep his instruction. We can affirm and reaffirm uh, that we belong to a Christian folk, 
that this is our religion, this is our belief, and we can set about the rather difficult and arduous procedure of trying to reshape ourselves into this divine likeness. It can be accomplished to a very great degree, and some minds are suited to it. Some have to approach it this way. Some have to fight step by step, conquering one by one the faults of themselves, girding on like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress the white armor of righteousness. These individuals are battling the negative parts of their own natures. They are striving to control and correct their habits. They are striving to live what to them is an archetypal Christian life, with the effort arising mentally and emotionally as a tremendous force, a kind of force that may come through conversion. And there is no one who tries more desperately to live the jots and tittles of his faith than one recently converted to it. He has a tremendous enthusiasm and a vast sincerity. But to a great many persons, this way is not best for them. It is a, a problem of continual and eternal self-control the individual fighting the negative in himself, fighting the strange war against the curious psychoses which burden his existence. He almost inevitably restates the words of Paul, that whenever he would do good, evil is nigh unto him. And he goes forth slaying dream demons, dragons, and monsters. Most of all, seeking to overcome the ogre in himself. Against this approach to the subject is the very approach that we see as we look out of our window on an Easter morning. We see the sun rising over a world returning to life. It is rather obvious that all these little blades of grass, all these flowers and buds, all these bulbs that are breaking through as the first growths of spring, these are not all fighting darkness. They are not fighting the earth in which their roots are laid. They are not fighting the cold. They are not in locked in some strange challenge with astronomy. They are not aware of the mystery of the equinox. What they are doing under the wise and eternal guidance of all provident nature is that they are simply being themselves. They are growing as they were destined and ordained to grow. And like all things that grow naturally, they become beautiful. They are not locked in a moral sectarianism. They are not trying to determine which denomination the Son of Heaven belongs to. This is not their problem. They are responding to light. They are responding to warmth. Like small children responding to love, the growths of nature resp respond to the love of life, which is in space, which is everywhere. And so there is this mystical way of coming into the experience of the holy life. This is the way of simply venerating the archetype in the heart simply relaxing into the truth which we have in ourselves. The opening of in some way of doors in walls which have locked our own lives within a very small and dark perspective. In mysticism, it is simply an act of complete surrender to principle. 
in the heart as the archetype of goodness. In the case of the Christian, this archetype is the figure, symbol, life, image of his Redeemer. The mere acceptance of this as a total ruler of life merely means that everything that to us is incorporated in this archetypal image, the image that we have created, let us face it, it is an image we have fashioned. We have fashioned it from the reading of the scripture. We have fashioned it from looking at great art and representations of Jesus by all the artists of the Christian world. We have found the face that we understand or believe or hold sacred in the painting of Leonardo or Michelangelo. These likenesses we have put together. We have added to them the faith of our parents, if they were persons of deep insight. We further add to them the faith of the famous persons of the world whom we have respected. The faith of Washington praying in the snow at Valley Forge. All of these faiths, these acceptances, these radiant uh, realities for us have come together within our own nature in the, in the heroic but very gentle and very kindly patient figure of Jesus of Nazareth. So he becomes our Jesus. There is no proof that in another man the image is exactly the same. Chinese Christians have a Jesus with Chinese features. This is not important. It is, represents an archetype of maturity. We may also say in perfect honesty that there could be some other archetype in that place. It isn't important what it is named. It isn't important what it looks like. The thing that is important is that whatever this archetype may be, it is the infinite quality of value. It is the highest goodness that we are capable of knowing, capable of sensing within ourselves, the shining example that we would like to follow. So what we really are faced with is only following the example. All the rest is more or less an intellectual burden, a responsibility upon the spirit. But if this inner earth pattern of realities is to us worthy of veneration, worthy of worship, if we regard it as the most holy thing that can be experienced or known to us, then our course of procedure is a very simple one. The simple procedure of the mystic who allows this presence to take over the management of his life, living from this pattern of realities, living from this radiant living form of truth within ourselves. If we do this, we are then under the guidance of a great teacher. This teacher being a code, a principle, an example, a code which is so real and so alive uh, that we instinctively revere it, instinctively seek to live it. So what we have finally is merely faith in the archetype, a faith that makes this archetype a living presence within us, a spirit in us, a spirit pattern from a universal spirit, but strangely made intimate to our needs. This spirit in us understands us. It knows the frailty of our flesh. It knows the faults that we will inevitably commit, even while we are trying to live a better life. This spirit does not demand perfection, nor does it censor us for every mistake we make. This spirit within us rewards honest effort. 
rewards fully knowing that effort is difficult. And this spirit within us is not to punish, but to rededicate us to this continual search for the beautiful and the good. This spirit then to each person becomes his own Christian mystery, becomes his own a source of the great code by which good men must live. It becomes the very beginning of the expression through ourselves of these great principles without which society cannot survive. We have watched the world. We can read its history, and we have lived through many very historic years. We see what happens when principles fail, when selfishness takes over, when corruption undermines the foundations of society. We can see every day what happens when we break the code. And all this is a valuable instruction, giving us greater courage to keep the code. And most of all, the realization that this code is real, because where it is lived, things go better. Where it is not lived, things become worse. So by experience, by the actual living of things, not by theories imposed by the past, not by superstitions invented by men, but rather through the direct impact of conduct upon nature and experience. By daily living, we learn to know that which is life and that which is death. In this way, the time, the history of things, has created these radiant likenesses, each one of which, while it appears to be a vision of some attenuated substance, is actually the strongest image that experience has been able to build. Into these beautiful mystical patterns have, have been built the hopes of men, the fears, the needs, the sufferings, the attainments of all mankind. And that is the reason why that among all the religions of the living faiths of men and those that have gone before, the divine image is essentially the same. It is the same because it has to arise from man's patterns of trial and error. And the extraordinary example that stands to us as the great inspiration is simply the proof in the life of a great person that truth is supreme, that it cannot be compromised, that it cannot be destroyed, that it cannot be neglected. So the archetype of Easter is what, as one of its meanings, the inevitable triumph of truth over error. The fact that truth, though obscured and destroyed generation after generation, will rise again. Because this truth is in us. In times of selfishness, we forget it. In times of hate, we deny it. But in the long, quiet hours of existence, it comes back. And as we grow older, it comes back more forcibly. And the th attitudes which we held in youth are no longer the attitudes of our maturity. And on Easter, we think of a mature philosophy. We think of a great maturity for ourselves. And we become aware that this maturity arises not from the gaining of wisdom, but from the giving of life, from the giving of the heart itself to these principles which are real. If we are truly dedicated, we shall have patience. If we are truly dedicated, we shall not judge others. If we are truly dedicated, we will be kind. And even in the moment of our greatest persecution, we'll ask the forgiveness of those that persecute us. There will be no retaliation. There will be no false pride, 
no ambition that requires the compromise of principles. And we shall gradually create situations of consciousness. We shall discover the great spiritual fact of the brotherhood of all that lives. Not only the brotherhood of peoples, of races, of nations, and of faiths, but the brotherhood of animals and flowers and plants and birds and everything. We shall discover that we are one life, bound together by one need, the need for growth, the need for truth, the need for light, of courage to go on, of strength to meet adversity. And in sharing the fulfillment of these needs, we gain the magnificence of our maturity. Therefore, we discover that maturity is not a sageness necessarily. It is a childlikeness, as Mencius, the Chinese philosopher, so clearly pointed out. And Jesus, when he reminded his disciples that little children of them and the like of them were made the kingdom of heaven, so that all these qualities uh, representing gentleness of spirit, arbitration of difficulties and differences, patience, gentleness, kindness, peacefulness, all these things make up the fulfillment of the natural archetype in ourselves. And I think we should say with certainty and clarity of thinking that a Christian is the individual who has permitted his inner conviction of the will of Christ to become the leader of his life, to move his will, to move his mind, to move his consciousness, to warm and brighten and enlighten his emotions, so that the Christian is the individual truly who lives from Christ within. And in living from this Christ within reveals this power, which to him is the most sacred thing in his world. And in this revelation of Christ through conduct, through the deeds of good, uh, through the communion of hearts, through the daily service of our fellow men, it is this revelation of the Christ in us rising from the selfishness and personality of, of previous ignorance. This is the Easter resurrection. For Christ in man is resurrected when the Christliness of man flows into the world. It is the release into manifestation. It is the heart and mind becoming the servants of principles, of truth, of beauty. Now, there are many who say that this is all modern sentimentalism, that the individual cannot live this kind of life. Well, we may point out that the individual has never survived by living any other kind of life. That up to the present time, we have had the story of human history made up of a few who lived well and died with a good hope. And though they were not emulated, in most cases, they were respected. And these few who kept the faith have become the great ideal heroes of mankind. To them we give the greatest honor, because in our instinct they are the most honorable. We have not been like them, but we have venerated them, fully aware that in all situations they have been the superior human beings. The rest has been made up of those who didn't care about such things, to whom all these great ideals were pleasant or unpleasant abstractions, but of no immediate concern. These others have lived their selfishness from the cradle to the grave. They have fulfilled their ambitions and drenched the earth in blood. 
They have profited each other from each other until they have brought down the structures of their enterprises in a hopeless bankruptcy. They have preyed upon each other in crime and violence. But out of all of this selfishness, no good has directly come. Men have only come to realize a little, perhaps, how terrible it is, how false it is, how useless it is. So we cannot point out that the rejection of ideals has ever resulted in a better world. But we can prove, at least on various occasions and in certain times, where groups who have attempted definitely to live these ideals have lived better and that these ideals have given us the greatest heritage of our art, our music, our culture. That in the beginning these ideals gave us our sciences and our philosophies, and that all the good things that we have were born of ideals, and all the evils that plague us were born from the lack of ideals or the corruption of them. So as we approach this particular occasion, as we stand in the midst of a symbol of universal restoration, we realize that nature gives life, that nature wants life, that nature wants things to grow and fulfill their destinies, and that when they grow properly, they grow beautifully. And out of this fulfillment comes the glory of the world as we see it, the glory of the great universe adorned as a bride, a wonderful, magnificent restoration of life from darkness. This is nature's way, and it would like also to see the restoration of human life through the rise of the sun of righteousness at the equinox of the soul. So out of this whole theory, out of this whole concept, we know that by ages of remembering through the great traditional descent, through the experience of man, we have these radiant images of true nobility, of absolute integrity, of unselfish and eternal love for man. These images of those who have loved are themselves most lovable. And from these images, we gain a certain prick of conscience, a certain insistence in ourselves that we should be more like them. That actually, it is better to be lovable than it is to be great that it is better to, hell, to hold the simple admiration of children than it is to be a ruler of empire. There are values, not only for here, but forever. And these values of beauty belong to foreverness. And little by little, we must come to the creation within ourselves of the image of a true maturity for our kind. And the only way we can do this is to choose the most advanced examples of our kind to build upon. If we live every day according to the best that has been lived, if we live each day serving as nobly as the wisest and most loving servants of men have served, we shall be moving victoriously and beautifully in the right direction. And we shall know as a personal experience of consciousness the resurrection of beauty and truth and love within ourselves. And whenever this occurs, on any day of the year, in any year of our lives, day or night, for each of us that moment is Easter morn.